Hello to you, our lovely patrons, and welcome to the next episode in our prestigious pint series where Paul and I have gathered together some of our heroes and inspirations from our career in Agile. This episode we chatted to the retrospective lady, what we called her, not what she calls herself, Esther Derby, and that was actually the first Porter conversation. How does she feel about you know, being being known for just a fraction of her suite of works over the many years that she's been inspiring all of us? Uh, we've got some really exclusive insights into how she got into the world of retrospectives, um, but also her interests in other areas, her inspirations herself, how she's been learning and developing and growing over the years, and her hopes for the future. It was, for us, absolutely fascinating, a whole hour that just absolutely flew by, and we hope you find it as interesting as we did. Cheers. Welcome. How are you? I'm good. <laughs> and, and Esther? I'm happy to, to be here. Yes, welcome to the bar. Thank you. We'd offer to get you something, but um, we can't. It's a little early in the day for me. <laughs> yeah, so you have to imagine that we're going to go and get you a drink, but we are having a drink. Great. What are you drinking? I'm drinking, well, this is a very good question to ask. I'm drinking a Hobgoblin. Oh, that's a, that's comes from near me somewhere, isn't it? Isn't that a local? Uh, Witchwood is that near you? Oh no, I was, I was Whitney else. in Oxford. No, it's not near me at all. <laughs> no, forget that. Forget I mentioned it. Mm. It's a it's a sort of fruity IPA with a devilish twist. It's a nice color. How about you, Paul? <clears throat> I've got, I'm trying to be good again. My um. My wife's reminding me of the fact I shouldn't drink um, too much. So I'm drinking Thatcher's Zero, which is cider, but it's non-alcoholic cider. So I think she's dropping me hints quite often now. The is hints it tasty? Are, um, I've, this is the first time I've tried it. I'm about to try it for the first time, and I will let you know. But um, Surely it's just apple juice. Exactly. I don't really have a, a, a great, a, most, a discerning palate. <laughs> um, it generally just takes it's expensive apple juice, fizzy apple juice, yeah. Mm. But I'll give it a try. All right. Well, I'd never heard the phrase hard cider until I went to America. Yeah, is what that is the only kind of cider you have in your country? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. But it is an yeah, essentially apple juice. Oh, and I'm drinking water. And how is that? Um, municipal tap water, it's just fine. Yeah? Yeah. It's always good to stay hydrated. <clears throat> cheers to you, Esther. Yeah, cheers, Esther. It's nice to see you and, and hear from you cheers. again. Yeah, very nice to see you. So you, it's been, it hasn't been, I was going to say recently, but it's probably not that recent, but you have moved relatively recently. Um, eight years ago. <laughs> Not that recent at all, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> really, eight years ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it um, time flies. Yeah, I moved from the largest metropolitan area in the state, which is you know a significant city, hmm. Minneapolis, to a town of one hundred and ten thousand. Mm -hmm. And the town I live in is, um, it's on the tip of Lake Superior. So I don't know how much you know about U.S. geography, but you know, if you think of it as a big box, my state mm. is right in the middle of the shares border in, with Canada. Yeah. And Lake Superior connects to Lake Michigan, which connects to, you know, a whole bunch of other lakes and eventually to the Atlantic Ocean. So mm. we get, we get ocean going ships in the port in my town. Brilliant which I think is just astonishing, turning off my, uh, turning off my notification so we don't get any dings in the background. Oh, that's um, so yeah, 17th, 17th busiest port in the country. So Ooh, are you a bit of a I ship spotter? <laughs> no, not at all. It's just, I happen to, well, I mean, I do, I do, I do notice the ships when they're in harbor. Yeah. And when they're sitting, waiting to go into the dock. 
works. My, my wife's but a bit I, of a ship geek now. <laughs> she's got a little app that um, she she can see what ship it is and what's on it and plot its route and find out where it's going. And she, she loves that. Amazing. Okay. I don't know if you can do that here. I suppose you can. Yeah. You're not really into ships, are you, Paul? No, I, no, not really. Um, don't get <laughs> don't don't get many ships in where I live, landlocked county that is Wiltshire in the in the UK. But uh, no. Well, I, I am twelve hundred miles from the coast, so. That must be bizarre, yeah, to get kind of yeah. proper shipping kind of containers and container yeah. ships just on in, in your backyard. Very strange. So, what have you been up to? What have I been up to? Well, um, like many people, I am trying to work mm -hmm. while at from home during a pandemic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I've been, um, you know, I've been figuring out how to take some of my workshops online that are able to go online. Mm -hmm. I've been doing some writing and walking How have you every found day. the whole online thing? Um. I there you know I am grateful that I am able to connect with friends of mine all over the world. Mm. I am enormously grateful for that, um, and I find that certain conversations work very well over Zoom. You know, I can still have really great um, consulting conversations and coaching conversations with people, but there are other things that just aren't the same, like conferences. Mm. It's not the same. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, it's, it's those kind of side corridor conversations which you yeah. just, you can't manufacture those really, can you? It's the, it's no. the op opportune meetings that, yeah, for coffee or whatever. I, I haven't run across any software that does that well. No. Um, and it's also, you know, it's just not the same, you know, you know, if you're giving a talk, you can relate to the people in the room and you can ask them questions and you can bounce off what they're Mm. concerns are and that's much harder to do mm. so have you that's have you had how to, i'm finding that have you had to turn um stuff down esther because um i certainly have in terms of conferences my workshops that i know it just won't work the stuff that i do won't work and have you had to turn many gigs down just as because online conferences won't work for you well i or i find a way to make them work yeah, I mean, I think I think that's one of the things that's been really interesting because I see a lot of people taking their regular workshop and putting together a mural board and saying, OK, it's the same workshop. We're just going to do all our stickies on a mural board. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but I, you know, I um, have found that that actually doesn't work for everything. And so I've been looking at how what can you do asynchronously, asynchronously and what do you need to do in a synchronous conversation which i think is the challenge that we're facing in all sorts of work right mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. you know what can we do asynchronously and what you know where do we save our energy for being on zoom calls because it, it, it being on a zoom call for three hours or all day is just deadly mm -hmm. it's just deadly and we apologize now for putting you on another Zoom call now. For, well, for I made it was a it was my choice. It was <laughs> yeah, my true. choice. Very true. <clears throat> Very true. So, I mean, you obviously won't need any introduction to our listeners, but um, you, you are part of our prestigious pint series where we've been oh rounding goodness. up rounding up some of our heroes and inspirations. So. Hmm. What, one thing I'm really interested in, because and we, Paul and I are both guilty of this to begin with, is that a lot of people, I think, we saw you as the retrospective person to begin with, because that's where we first came across you in our direct The retrospective lady. Um, but you were a lot more before then and a lot more after then as well. And we've worked together on different things like mm -hmm. conflict facilitation and so on in different organisations. Mm -hmm. um, but I think... Do you still find people refer to you as, maybe not to your face, but <laughs> the retrospective lady? Um, yeah, I think there are there are people who know me for that, and that's okay. You know, I mean, you know, I think it was uh, doing retrospectives in a in a thoughtful way as a contribution to the field. Mm. So I I don't reject that title, but you're right. It's not, it's you know it's this much of what I do. I mean, I you know I started as a programmer and I was mm -hmm. a dev manager and. I've been a consultant for 
many years so it's certainly does it's not the it does not indicate the breadth of my experience yeah. you were doing lead you were writing about leadership before retrospectives it's oh, the, yeah. the retrospectives thing came along at exactly the right time when everybody yeah. was crying out for how do we do this yeah. really difficult but important ceremony yeah. when we don't have a huge amount of soft skills within the organization and emotional intelligence within the organization and you or you, facilitation skills yeah uh, and you gave the community such an easy way of of doing that mm -hmm. that it, it really resonated mm. um, but we were talking to roman pichler the other day about how he's sort of referred to as the product owner guy and he doesn't really like that in a way because it's kind of a, a label that he appreciates how much people mm -hmm. invest in that part of his character but we kind of do that don't we we do tend to sort of reduction not reduction yeah things. well it's easier for people to figure out i mean in, in a lot of ways i'm in terms of leadership and management i'm a generalist mm -hmm. you know but that's that's hard for people to figure out oh how can she help me she said well whatever your problem is i can probably figure out something that will be helpful as long as it's not deeply technical because i yeah. haven't written code in a long time um but that's that's hard for people to kind of latch on to so i think it is easier for people to latch on to one thing do you have a particular thing that people come to you and you, you enjoy more than others that's an interesting question I don't think it's the thing. I think it's the interactions. Okay. So I really like working in partnership with people where we're, you know, I'm a sounding board, but I may have some advice and based on my experience. And um, so, yeah, that kind of working in partnership, helping people figure things out, I think is great. Mm. That's what I really like. And sometimes that's in whole organizations and sometimes it's one-on-one. -on -one and since since um, pre if you go back pre pandemic, um, how you, how are you over the last since particularly because I was inspired heavily by your work around retrospectives and I know you mentioned that's so only a fraction of what you do. Do you think you've changed over the last kind of fifteen to twenty years in terms of what you how you work or what you enjoy? Well, I um, I certainly know different things than I did 15 or 20 years ago I think I'm you know I I didn't you know I didn't stop learning when I turned 40 mm. um or 50 <laughs> we won't go any further <laughs> um, um so you know I'm certainly um Dave Snowden's um complexity work has informed the way I think about things um so I've incorporated more of that complexity awareness into mm. the way I work. Mm. Um, yeah, you know, I've just, I've, I've learned a lot of things along the way. Um, I've learned much more about the importance of empathy. Um, That's an interesting one because I would, yeah. uh, empathy is something that I would, one of the words that I would almost instantly attach to you. Mm. So it strikes me as, as, as almost strange that that's something that you've almost grown in. Uh, because it's almost, I just assume that's something that you were naturally born with, a superpower almost. Do you know what I mean? Mm -mm. No, um, somebody, it, it, it's interesting. Somebody was um, said on Twitter, you know, I was trying to talk somebody into, you know, going across the street to hear Esther Derby talk about something. And they, and they said, oh no, she's, she's too um you know she's too fluffy she's too soft skills and i find that really ironic because that's not where i started out okay mm. i mean i started out you know in programming because it was so much easier than talking to people <laughs> which it really isn't but um but yeah i was um you know described as um, maxi analytical and I came from a family, I grew up in a family that was extremely critical. So you get very analytical and very critical and empathy doesn't, you know, necessarily find much um, ground to grow in there. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I made a conscious effort to develop my capacity for empathy. Hmm. And um, I, I guess I succeeded. Yeah, I'd say but it's not, it's not something I, I grew up with, which 
makes me aware that when I, you know, when I run into people who, who seem to be lacking in empathy or don't see the value in empathy, that they can change. I mean, it is possible to develop that yeah. as, a, as a characteristic. Hmm. Are, are there any, that makes me so, ask, are there any characteristics that you don't think we're capable of developing? That people aren't capable of developing? Yeah. Well, I think people can develop almost anything. It's it's what's the what's the effort involved and what's the payoff. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not I'm not sure I um, will ever uh, be good at chess. Just not how my mind works. I mean, I could probably train it to work that way, mm -hmm. but but it's not it's not what I'm interested in. Okay. So I think that, you know, I, I think people can develop all sorts of traits mm. and, and, you know, our, our brains are plastic. We can, we can develop new neural pathways. And if we attend to them, they will eventually um, carry more weight than what our original habits were. Mm. So you still, Esther, do you still um, get involved in facilitation? Are you still doing active facilitation now for larger groups? Uh, not in this, not in this time. No. No. Um, and I think remote facilitation is its own thing. Okay. You know, I think it's, I think it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's own skill. So I was at a, <clears throat> I was at a conference in South Africa a couple of years ago. And I mean, you know how it is when you go to dozens and dozens of conferences at a, at a certain point, you just was like, oh, I hope I can find some session to go to. <laughs> so I, I wandered into um, I wandered into a session on remote facilitation by um, Kirsten Clacy and Jay Allen Morris. Mm -hmm. Do you know those two? No, Kirsten, I don't know Jay. Well, um, anyway, I wandered into their session, and um, it was the best the best advice on the mechanics of remote facilitation that I had seen. Okay, and it, it is it, it is it is its own thing. It, you know, they're, they've written a, a nice little book about it. Yeah. This was pre-COVID as well, so this was before the pandemic. Yeah. Oh, they rushed the publication of the book. Right. Okay. Yeah. So I I actually introduced them to my publisher, and I said, "You should write a book. Yeah, yeah. You should yeah. publish it." And they yeah. did. <laughs> so. What was that one piece of advice that stood out for you? Um, I don't know if it was one piece. It was just the, you know, the whole, the whole thing. Okay. Um, you know, I, I think maybe it was that, and this, this applies to um, moving workshops online also, is that you just have to be a lot more explicit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. You can't be hand wavy. No. You can, it, you know, when you're in person, you can kind of, you know, give a general instruction and then people will ask and, and people will, <clears throat> be okay kind of figuring it out on their own but that's not the case in a remote setting right so i think you just have to be a lot more explicit i think you're right i find my i'm having to repeat myself maybe two three times and then you get nothing back <laughs> it's like is that is that okay is, is, is that does that make sense yeah. and it's like i find myself almost a semi-patronizing way of thinking should i have to say that or i think actually i do have to say that because it's, yeah. You have to be, a, like you say, a lot more explicit online. Yeah. And, and, and I often have, you know, duplicate what I'm saying in writing. So people have yeah. it in two places. And, and I, chunk, I chunk information differently. So here's the first part. Okay, do that. Here's the second part. Because, you know, people's attention is pulled in so many more ways mm. in, in a remote setting that I think it, the ability to retain is different. Mm. Do you think it will bounce straight back? Let's let's say or uh, everything's going to be fine. Everything will be rosy at the end of it, and there's a, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. All those nice cliches. But a year from now, let's say two years from now, do you think we'll be doing things differently with with yes. on the back of what's happened? Yes. In what way? Well, I I I think that uh, there were many many workplaces that had taken the stance of saying no 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 remote work everybody has to be in person and so we've now realized that oh yeah well we can accomplish a lot when we're not um, together um so i think i think that's going to have a lasting effect 
that people are going to be more um, open and more sophisticated in how they incorporate remote work. Mm. Um, I'm kind of curious about and concerned about what's going to happen to all of the um, all of the mothers who have left the workforce. Mm. I think that's going to really have uh, have an effect on things, and whether they come back. Mm. Right, because <clears throat> I mean, I, I occasionally run into organizations that expect people to maintain exactly the same level of productivity they had pre-lockdown yeah. now. And, mm. you know, our, our contexts have collapsed. Mm. You know, we used to have a separate home and a separate work. And now, oh, look, you're in my living room. Um, and that's true for everybody. You know, we're in, we're in their spare bedroom or the living room or the kitchen and you know, the kids are there and... Um, so I think it's, you know, completely unreasonable to expect that there will be no change in performance mm -hmm. because, you know, as I already said, you know, we're at home during a pandemic trying to work. We're not mm -hmm. actually just working from home. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I worry what's going to happen to all the mothers who, you know, something had to give and it was the job. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I, I, I'm kind of hopeful that actually the greater flexibility will make it easier. Um, so we're getting, we're seeing changes in stance over here. And this isn't just to do with work, it's to do with school as well. So mm -hmm. having had a lockdown through the winter, um, my kids were being told, you know, you stay normal school hours. But then they realized, well, actually they were, they were not getting to see sunlight um, because by the time they finished school, it was dark. And so they, they said, well, that's not a good idea. So maybe what do we have to have, you know, regular school hours maybe we could be more flexible with that mm -hmm. and similarly we're seeing workplaces saying well you know you don't necessarily need to be online nine to five uh, because you can do things a lot more flexibly now and so the flexibility could potentially make it easier um, mm -hmm. but equally it can be abused as well uh, and people can get left behind well that uh, and that gets back to you know what has to be synchronous and what can be asynchronous mm -hmm. right and there's a lot of things that kids do at school and that people that adults do at work mm -hmm. that, you know, they are actually able to do it on their own and then come back together mm -hmm. to integrate or to discuss or to yeah. uh, decide. Yeah. So the, 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 my kids, for example, they shifted to up until I think 1230 or one o'clock or something. They were in you know, regular type you know, mm -hmm. together with teachers and things. And then the afternoons were very much sort of self-directed, you know, give them some problems to solve or go out and do some exercise or whatever. Um, and they're, they're learning, right? they're, they're, they're figuring it out. I wonder whether, this is a question I was going to ask the two of you, and it'd be unfair for me to ask it without really having thought it through myself. I'm kind of thinking as I ask it, but whether the kind of questions that people are asking you have changed now. Um, I think where my mind was going with this is, is around sort of second guessing people's thoughts. So, you know, I get a lot, a lot of scrum masters, for example, who say, I don't really know how people are doing when they're at home and I don't really want to pry, mm. uh, but equally I don't want to, you know, ignore them. Um, and I can't pick signals up as much as I used to. So, so what do I do? Do I ask, do I check in with them more often or, or less often? These kinds of questions are different to the ones that I was getting asked before. Are you seeing mm. any kind of different questions? Do you want to go first, Esther? From you? No, I was going to let you go first while oh, okay. I thought about it. <laughs> good, yeah, good ploy. Um, I think, I think people, um, I do get a lot of people asking um, now in classes and, and workshops about how to deal with those situations. It came up just today, actually, um, and we were talking about um, team. I'm going to say. I think it was like a kind of a team building activity or a, te a team building um, exercise. And we talked about the applications of it. And we said, we, obviously, the st standard response is a new team that needs to learn how to trust each other and that type of stuff. And someone said, well, actually, this is going to be essential when teams um, that have been online for a long time need to, they actually come back into an office, mainly with people that they've never actually met before, mm -hmm. have only ever met via video camera. 
there's people that have been employed and, and taken on new jobs and they've been working with teams maybe for up to 12 months now that they've never actually met. So I think maybe a lot of the advice stroke um, techniques that we're using are going to be used in a very different way and people are going to expect to see maybe different responses from people doing these things because they just haven't had that physical um, working together connection before. Well, I mean, I, this isn't necessarily, well, it is a work context actually, but I, you know, there are lots of people that I met online long before I met them in person. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, that was just fine. Mm. You know, it was just a, a kind of an added and welcome dimension. This was, <laughs> was really nice. Um, but I think it, it's, you know, we lose all of those opportunistic um, opportunities to get to know people. So, so I, I, the questions I'm hearing are like, well, um, you know, how do, like you mentioned, Jeff, how do I, how do I stay connected with people? You know, if I can't just walk along and around and have a casual conversation, how do I stay connected with people? So I think it's, it, I think, you know, having, particularly if you're a manager, having some kind of one-on-one -on -one time with people is really important. And it doesn't have to be an hour. It can be a half an hour. Um, I get people occasionally, I hear people asking, um, you know, how do I know people are working? Well, you know, you look at the output. I mean, I frankly don't care if someone is spending half the day on the, on their playing video games on their couch, as long as they're getting the work done. I don't, I don't really care. You know, yeah. that goes back to that flexibility thing. Um, <clears throat> but I think one thing that people don't ask me about, but I think is super important is how do you how do you create networks now how do you maintain all of those um you know this is not the someone i'm working with directly but you know mm. you know i i i talk to them and i learn things about the organization or i run into them at lunch or i run into them at the coffee bar or wherever yeah. so i think it, um one of the things i'm talking to people about doing is having some sanctioned time for idle chatter yeah you know either before a meeting or having a you know if you're doing slack or something like that having a specific channel that's set aside from that for that that's broader than just just the immediate team it can be for the immediate team but you know having one that crosses boundaries i think mm. is helpful the person <laughs> i'm coaching at the moment actually um mentioned something to me and i didn't delve more into it at the time because it wasn't really pertinent but the the the, the seed was planted in my head and then it was sort of germinated by a, a almost a cold call email i received on the similar kind of topic and he said that he was having i can't remember the term he used but basically it's like a random coffee call so in his company you can sign up to be a part of this group mm -hmm where anybody in the organization gets paired with somebody else somewhere else in the organization for a 15 minute chat. And it's their way of trying to just increase that connection across the company and an attempt at networking. Um, that almost like a, you've, you've actually just got stuck next to them in the queue in the canteen, that, mm. that type of thing, you know? I love uh, that. So sort of institutionalized. Yeah informal chats if you like yeah I think, I think i think it would be helpful to give some people some primer questions on that though yeah because that, yeah. that could be difficult for certain people but yeah almost like speed dating i suppose isn't it that kind of you have a few quick questions to icebreakers type questions <laughs> i think that yeah and the um he he seemed to suggest that it was something that you, know, you were given a little bit of an a uh, uh, preparation for if you like yeah. not, not mm. training in but you know and this is some of the things that you could be talking about and here's some yeah. examples of the things that went well and so on yeah. um i thought that's an interesting idea i think they're just going to see a lot more of those types of innovations to address those types of yeah. problems so one one of the uh, companies i um am familiar with they have all sorts of and they've been doing remote work for a long time they have all sorts of little um I don't know what they call them, but, you know, little sanctioned groups. So it might be the people who bought chips, mm -hmm. 
like your wife, or it might yeah. be people who knit, or it might be people who um, homebrew, you know, yeah. but they have all of these groups um, where that cross organizational boundaries mm -hmm. and cross organizational levels. And that's another way that they are, are maintained, they maintain networks in a, in a, yeah. in a remote distributed setting. But I think it's super important. Is there a risk with that? And that's a quick, this is a question for both you and Jeff and Esther here, but um, is there a risk that people get tooled out with this stuff though? That's, and that's what I've seen now, particularly with this, th we're in our third lockdown now, is that mm -hmm. the, the notion of the, the novelty of, of tools and Zoom and all these uh, um, Slack and everything, oh, we can use these tools. And that was very exciting. And that was quite innovative in the first few months. But now I think that's, that's, that's quite, there's an apathy to that. Another, the last thing I want to do when I've finished work is to open another tool to talk to more people online. You know what I mean? Yeah, oh, I think people are zoomed out for sure. They're completely. Yeah. So I think the, um, it is, I, I agree. Um, uh, but I think there's a, there's a, there's a, almost a, it's gonna sound a bit weird to go back to mobile phones yeah, almost regressing to mobile phones, but the old voice call. Just using a voice like, call, yeah. That's where, that was the medium that this um, sort of coffee chat thing was over. It was oh, okay. it, not, not a Zoom thing, it was, there's no video. So and so just people audio. would, yeah, yeah, people would often be out for a walk. They wouldn't be in the office. They would be, you know, wandering around, almost ah, like wandering okay. around the corridor uh, or, or even having their lunch, you know? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, well, for, ma for many years, important conversations happened over the phone. Yeah, and the golf course, yeah. or, uh, <laughs> or over the phone. Yeah, and and you know, some people actually find that they can concentrate better. They're they're more attuned to nuances in tone and pacing and so forth mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. they are on Zoom. And Zoom, or you know, whatever it is you're using, Teams or Blue Jeans or whatever. It's highly, you know, these, these spaces are highly evaluative, you know, like we're always looking at other people and some of our empathy seems to be a little stripped away, but we're looking at their house, we're looking at, their <laughs> we're looking at ourselves. Yeah, of course we are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and this, so this came up with, we had a chat with, with Mike as well, Mike Cohn about this, that, because Mike was saying that we talked about face to face. So obviously Agile Manifesto principle about mm -hmm. we're valuing face to face. And I'm not necessarily sure because we were talking about is Zoom face to face, and Mike was Mike was on the side of saying, "Well, yeah, I think it is," and I'm I'm thinking, oh, "No, I don't think it is." So, what's what's your view on is this classed as face to face conversation? This conversation we're having now for you? I think it is different than if we were in, you know, if we were really in a pub together. And I think part of it is that you know people are more evaluative. And you can't read the cues as well, and it's more tiring mm. because your focal distance doesn't change. It's always the same unless you look out your window. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I, you know, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't have a dogmatic opinion on that. No. Okay. Mike was always also um, unsurprisingly very. Um, the word appreciative of you mm. um, in particular of, of in, being quite uh, insistent that retrospectives were a part of scrum um, and grateful as well I said, well, he wasn't really pushing for that and he's glad that you did yeah. um, do you remember that I don't remember pushing <laughs> <laughs> he probably didn't use the word push <laughs> um, that's probably yeah my, my, my spin, but they're suggesting that it was a good idea. Well, I, 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 you know, I think if you're going to say that your method is built around inspecting and adapting, you need a way to inspect and adapt hmm. your, your, you know, the way you're working as well as your product. So oh, it's yeah. a logical fit from that standpoint. You know, how else are you going to systematically improve? I mean, it's, it's not, it's not the only way you can improve. I mean, people make improvements informally but it, but uh, being a little mindful about what sort of improvement you want to make yeah. it only made sense to have something like a retrospective was there anything in particular going on around that time that that sort of led you down the route of writing agile retrospectives with diana 
Is, is there a reason that that was there at that moment in time? Well, so um, Diana and I were introduced to each other by Norm Kurth, mm -hmm. who wrote the book on project retrospectives. So at the, you know, at, at the time he wrote that book, you know, projects could last a year or two or five, you know, so, so we had, the three of us had started the retrospective facilitators gathering and that's where um, we first started thinking about, you know, how can we do this in a more compressed mm. you know, instead of a year, what do you do if you've got, you know, you're looking at two weeks or a month. Yeah. Um, so that's where we first started really looking at it. So, and that would have been, I don't know, 2002, 2003, somewhere in there. Yeah. That we first started, started and maybe even a little earlier than that, I'd have to look, look things up, but. Mm. That was what the, the impetus was. And um, yeah, and so now it's been, what? It's been 16 years since that book came out. Good Lord. And it's still topping the charts. Yeah, it's still selling really well. And I think it's time for a second edition. <gasps> Is that a hint? Is that an exclusive? <laughs> There's nothing has been signed. <laughs> I, I still use it now. Is, is there anything so, without you know, without talking about a potential second edition? But um, is there anything that you think you would go back and adjust if you had? You know, oh yeah. yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so one thing I would do is I'd put a lot more emphasis on using data. Okay. Um, someone actually said to me once, "Perspectives are not for data; they are just for feelings." And, <laughs> Well, I, I wrote the book. I the data. Um, so, so I, I would be much more explicit about how to use data in retrospectives, where where it fits, where where you need objective data, where you can deal with subjective data, um, how that fits into problem solving and figuring out what to improve. Um, so that's a big one. Um, obviously, I would include much more on distributed uh, remote retrospectives mm, and yeah. how to work with those. And there's some other things I would just, you know, I would just change. I think we, we talked about goals in the retrospective, and I think that word confused people because we were talking about what topic are you going to focus on, really. Um, so I would change that. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd probably switch out some of the activities, you know, that I've you know, some of them have turned out to be difficult for people to facilitate and, you know, so different set of activities and probably much more about how to think about a focus and then how to put exercises or activities together in a way that has a, a flow to mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what your focus is determines what the data is going to be and the data you know, that determines what kind of um, thinking process is going to be useful for generating insights. You know, does it have to be something really analytical or are you looking for something more creative? Um, and then how do you decide? I mean, you know, can you actually evaluate these things objectively or is it just how people feel about it? So mm. those are some of the things that I would do differently or add to. Yeah, nice. You got, I can't, can't hear you, Jeff. Hear you. Jeff, you're on mute. <laughs> we'll, um, we'll edit that bit. <laughs> yeah, that never happened. Uh, and hypothetically, how how high towards the top of your product backlog might something like that be? Um. So this is this is like the this is the 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 curse of being a generalist is that I'm interested <laughs> in a lot of mm, things. Yes. And I'm, um, I'm always presented with interesting projects. So yeah, where is it on my list? You know, it, it uh, once conversations are further along, the priority may very likely change. Yeah, that's actually a kind of question that I was gonna ask you because not, not in a what do you regret kind of way, but in a simply that you must have had so many opportunities and you wouldn't have been able to do them all. 
is there anything that you you, know, you wish you'd have had more time to have done at the same time, if you like? That doesn't really make sense as a question, but do you know where I'm going with it? Well, I mean, we all make choices sure. about where to spend our limited time and our limited um, life energy. I wish um, I bought more Apple stock 20 years ago. But... <laughs> well, yeah, there's <laughs> things like that. Um, but this year has been interesting for that because yeah. I haven't been traveling. So, you know, I spent a lot more time thinking about the garden. Mm -hmm. I spent a lot more time, you know, making garments, specifically garments with pockets. <laughs> <laughs> you know that women's garments are often made without pockets. Not something I've noticed. Well, <laughs> notice your daughter's clothes. You have a daughter, right? Yeah, we, well, yeah, 18 years old now. Oh, wow. Might be a little different now, but particularly kids' clothes never has pockets. <laughs> so. So you wish yeah, you'd made so, more clothes, or? Uh, um. I've just, I've just spent my time on some different things, mm -hmm. you know, since I haven't been traveling. And is that, it sounds like there's an element of, of enjoyment out of that. You enjoyed that part of it? Oh, yes. I enjoy making garments with pockets and then wearing them. I, I found it funny that I've actually missed some things that I never thought I would miss. Oh, like what? Well, I never thought I'd miss getting on a train. Mm hmm. Is that just though absence? Because you, you, you haven't done it, you, get, you think, oh, I wonder what it's like. Not that you would enjoy being on the train, would you? Right now, I would <laughs> love to get on a train <laughs> for a couple of hours. I haven't even driven a car. I, 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 my car got taken away in summer last year. I haven't owned a car for almost a year. So there's no point. So now I, I haven't been on the plane like you. I still haven't been on the plane for a long time. And yeah. that's not something we're used to. Um, it's the, it's funny the things that I miss, and I'd, I'd speak to people who, you know, to, to begin with, there was a sense of oh, it's brilliant. I don't have to do I don't have to do the commute. But actually, they're finding yep. when they look back, the amount of processing they did, mm. uh, yep. decompressing they did, and actually yep. splitting work and home in that commute, there's an element of that that they do quite strongly miss. Yeah. Well, that's where people listen to podcasts. That's where I read books on airplanes. Yeah, that's yeah. where I, almost exclusively where I read. So I, you know, I listen to audio books now. Yeah, yeah like, like you said, Jeff, there is that flexibility. But I think the downside is is the downtime. Is that certainly I can, I can probably only speak from my own opinion, but and I noticed with you, Jeff, as well. Um, emails or text messages i get on the weekends and i'm thinking jeff it's it's like sunday night you and you're working now and you so there's it's less there's more of a blurred line between now what's downtime and what isn't whereas those those journeys home from work that train journey home was a way to literally yeah. da download it and then and then close the laptop wasn't it mm -hmm. or whatever it might be yeah i think that i think i think both the processing time and the transition time was an important element that's that's gone because mm. our context have collapsed yeah entirely mm. yeah. i'm a lot more appreciative though so you say what do you miss jeff but i've there's things that i've noticed that um i didn't realize that were there during the last 12 months so and a good example is um my local area <laughs> i think if anything because i've been walking with my family a lot more than mm -hmm. i ever have I know, literally, I, I don't think I've ever walked as many uh, miles in, in, in a calendar year. But there's, there's parts of, as to where I live that I probably would never have visited by foot had this mm -hmm. pandemic never happened. Mm -hmm. Is that a similar thing for you, Esther? Have you, have you discovered anything new during the last 12 months that you didn't realise was there? Well, I mean, I, you know, we haven't had a strict lockdown, but we have certainly been advised not to have unnecessary um, unnecessary adventures outside of home but yeah i i have um i have gotten into the habit of walking you know two and a half miles a day with a couple of friends of mine we stay far apart but we walk on the same trail and um you know i never thought i'd be walking when it was below zero fahrenheit but i do <laughs> and and so that's that's been a habit that's really been lovely to cultivate and you know sometimes i just to get out of the house i just go for a drive so i've seen parts of this area that i hadn't seen before mm -hmm. 
Mm. That's been kind of lovely. Mm. I think it certainly has put a spotlight on um, in this country and in, certainly in my family within these four walls of, of everyone's mental health and how, how mm -hmm. important that is. And um, I'm noticing, mm -hmm. maybe you just do notice it, notice it online and through our community a lot more, but a lot more people focused around you know, mental health, mindfulness and, and, and well-being. And I think that's, if, if anything positive is going to come out of this, then mm -hmm. I'm hoping that organisations pay a lot more attention to that as a result of this, this, time of this pandemic. One can hope. Yeah. One can hope. Do you, do you oh. see organisations, Esther, that have completely regressed, that have gone the other way? So instead of that flexibility, that self-organising nature of trusting people to get on with their work without you know, having to check up on them, have you seen organisations that have regressed back to...? Well, there was, there, there was a huge run on um, tracking software. As oh, really? As the, yes, there was a huge run. No way. Um, um, you know, companies scrambling to get software installed, key, you know, keystroke trackers and wow. you know, webs, you know, tracking where, what websites people were looking, looking at. It's huge, which really? uh, is so destructive of trust. Yeah. And, and, you know, yeah, I mean, I just, the whole idea of, you know, we have to know what you're doing and your productivity is in your keystrokes. It's so, um, antithetical to the kind of work we actually do in developing software and you know i mean I, I don't care if people are you know taking a break and looking at some stupid website you know i don't really care as long as you know the work is getting done in a reasonable way and we have reasonable standards mm. recognizing that you know we're at home during the pandemic there's one company well this is not just one company I spoke to, but I'm, I'm sure it's quite more widespread that was requiring if, you know, if your toddler needed some attention for you know, two minutes, you were supposed to clock out. Really? It's just crazy. Imagine, imagine the overhead, it's, the cost of actually doing that. <laughs> I know. It's like it would, it would be far more time than you would spend dealing with your kid, you know, and, it, and it's just unreasonable. It's unreasonable. It comes from a, a significant insecurity, though, doesn't it? There, there must be some very dysfunctional drivers behind that. Well, it comes from the idea that the, the whole job of management is to extract the maximum labor, mm. right? And that, you know, we have, we have purchased your time for eight hours a day, and you must be, you know, with your fingers on the keyboard. Mm. It's crazy that some companies still still work that way, isn't it? Even today, well, it, 2021. That, that, that whole mindset is deeply, deeply embedded in management thinking and management practices. Even it's now, you think embedded. that even even now, that's not changed in, you know, do you think that will ever change? Do you think that's here to stay? Well, I think if people realize where it comes from, it might change. Hmm. But, you know, I, you know we, we aren't taught the history of management. We're taught management theory that is essentially based on observational studies mm. right so like our management theories are based on how people manage right rather than you know actual motivation of humans and and how people work best in groups mm. but, you know a lot of the people are probably sick of hearing me say this but a lot of the um, practices that um, have made their way into into productivity thinking are directly tied to extraction of maximum labor. Mm. Because accounting practices, early accounting practices emerged on um, plantations using enslaved labor. Mm. That's where they really started doing, oh, we have to account for all of our expenditures and all of our outputs to our distant um, owner, mm. right? So I think until people kind of, you know, realize that and say huh hmm, that's not what we want to do <laughs> exactly yeah until they'd realize that yeah Fair has point. there been anything do you think that's a sort of significant event or person or something that's had a really significant impact on that shift in that in the right direction that you that that's had a real impact well what comes to mind for me that's a, a long a roundabout answer is a, a an interview I saw with Meg Wheatley. 
could probably find again if I if I looked. But um, they were they were talking about um, some study of coal mines in I believe it was Wales, where the conditions were so bad that the managers would no longer go down into the mines. So the miners organized themselves and productivity went up. Mm. So, I mean, we've known that for decades. Mm -hmm. We've known that self-organization works for decades. And what Meg Wheatley said in this interview was, we've known that for decades and people will always choose control. They choose control over productivity. It's crazy, isn't it? It's crazy. When people ask me why that is, I, I, I don't know why, but my instinct is, is to do with safety uh, and risk. Uh, in that it seems like the safest thing to do is to let somebody else make the decision or to pay somebody to make a decision. Mm. Uh, but it's a, to me, it's that, it's that false certainty. And in a, in a way, you're selling off value for a certain level of certain lower effectiveness. Well, for the illusion of control. Yeah. Is there another main reason behind that? That people go for control? I well, I think, you know, I think, you know, so I, I actually think it is much more um, informative to read the history of management than to read the theory of management. Um, and the history of management is people who had wealth and, edu and education being the owners and people who had far less access to resources and far less wealth and far less education being the workers. And so there's a separation of head and hands. Mm. And it comes through very clearly in, if you look at um, Taylor, right? Um, and, and, and that that also feeds into our management practices, even though it's utterly, you know, particularly in the fields we work in, you know, it, it, it makes no sense because we, you know, we are all highly educated people and highly intelligent people doing knowledge work. Mm -hmm. So those traditions make no sense, but they are embedded, that, that thought is embedded in the practices and so it comes out in how people practice management. So I, I, I perhaps, I'm not saying that I, I'm, but so Robert Greenleaf, I see as someone that inspired Scrum to a degree. I think there's, there's a link there somehow, even if, even if Ken Schraber is particularly um, dismissive of it. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea of servant leadership underpinning the role of the Scrum Master and I went back and read his Greenleaf's work a year or two ago, just just for the hell of it, I think, and was amazed at how relevant it was to what's going on in the world now, still 70 years later. Um, and one of the things that stuck out for me is actually on this topic, because he said back in the 50s or whatever, that gen gen the vast majority of people will choose some kind of order over disorder, yeah. even if that disorder is delivered by a brutal non-servant and in the process they lose their freedom the majority of people will choose it now he didn't really explain why he thought that was the case and it was 70 years ago so maybe things are slightly different now um maybe we're not quite as tolerant as we were then and subservient as we were then i'm not quite sure but i think it's an important factor because there i i get a lot of people say to me oh yeah self-organization that I, I can get it in theory but when I give people the opportunity, they just don't take it. Well, I think there can be a number of reasons behind that. Mm. Um, part of it is that um, people are, are, because they're new to it, they are not necessarily adept at creating the conditions for healthy self-organization. Because there's always has to be a balance between, you know, where are you headed and what are your constraints? And, and if people don't have those, you know, it's, it can be overwhelming. It's like, um, you know, so we have to figure out everything. And that means everybody is going to be, you know, arguing about, you know, what we're supposed to be doing and how we're supposed to be doing it. And, and, and that's not that fun, right? So... 
<clears throat> so I think people are not not yet adept at, you know, here's the North Star, here's the outcome we're headed to, here, here's the boundaries, you know, so the economic boundaries, the time boundaries, the, you know, the tool set you can choose from, um, you know, here's, here's, a, you know, an abhorrent solution, here's, here's what we want to see more of, that would actually create a sort of container in which people can can figure out how to how to work with that problem yeah. mm. so people i think are you know self-organized and people are just kind of left with nothing mm. it's like so then what do you do you either you know you sit there and you wait because you're kind of paralyzed mm. or you, you know you end up like a team i got a call about which they had not delivered anything for two years they've been arguing for two years about what to do and i i, I asked the manager well, well did you step in and talk to them about the goal? And she said, no, they are self-organizing. I didn't want to interfere with their self-organizing, which is absurd, right? So, so I mean, that's the kind of reason that I think people have problems with it. And, you know, people who have been under control, management control for many years, and then suddenly it's like, oh, no, now we want you to self-organize. You know, skeptical mm -hmm. much? Yeah, I can see why people are skeptical. Yeah. yeah, I can see why people who are, you know, given no boundaries and then, you know, <clears throat> make some kind of mistake and get slapped down for it are, are hesitant. I get that. I think so. This this pandemic is a good example of this. Is that I th I still think that um, employees <laughs> need, and it's not it doesn't have to be heavy handed kind of controlling management here. But there's there's an air of not certainty either but safety isn't it that that this is yes we acknowledge this is a scary time but we've got uh, this is, these are our strengths as a company these are our these are our constraints that we're working with and this this is how we're going to provide that sense of safety for you as, as staff and, and employees and i think you can still provide that without necessarily I've seen I've seen the other way where, where CEOs have come down very hard to say, look, we need to we need to take back control of, of what we're doing here. We need to keep an eye on you, and and that's that's pro that's not safety. That's that's taking it too far the other way. I want to ask you a question. I know, I know I've asked you a lot of questions, but there's one I want to ask you. So um, I said that you were you were one of our heroes. When you're one of our inspirations, who have been your inspirations in your career? Well, <clears throat> sorry, I seem to be having some congestion. Um, but the, the obvious, the obvious one is Jerry Weinberg. Mm -hmm. um, I I met Jerry um, in 1991, 90 or 91, somewhere in there. And for those of you who don't know Jerry, he he um, wrote one of the seminal books on, on computer programming just the psychology of computer programming he, he was really um focused on the human aspects of of, of um, developing software even though he made he made significant technical contributions he was on the mercury project um, so meeting him and and then studying with him and then working with him I and mean, i co-taught a workshop with him for the last um, 12 years up until the time he retired at age 82. So that was... Uh, yeah, that was one of my biggest regrets, not going on the PSL course when I had the chance with, yeah. with you two. Well, <clears throat> when was well, that, we'll do it again. I, oh, yeah. um, it, it, he bequeathed it to me and Don Gray. So, mm. so uh, you know, when we can get together again, we'll do another PSL. But, um, yeah, so he, he had an enormous effect on my... On my uh, both my personal life and my professional life. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? So, um, probably Jean McClendon, who is not in this field. She's actually a, a licensed clinical social worker. Mm -hmm. And um, I learned a lot about how human systems work from her. And um, I learned a lot about openness from her. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. So that's true. Mm-hmm. That's good. 
And I'm conscious we've already taken up a lot of your time, but uh, I'd, well, like to, I'd like to end on a, on a, on a future looking thing. So what are, you, what are you hopeful for for the next few years, five years time? That is a tough question. I mean, uh, you know, in, in terms of the world, I, I, I hope that uh, we have an opportunity here to, to get some um, deeper international cooperation on climate issues. Mm -hmm. So I feel, I feel some hope about that right yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. Um, Uh, I hope for our profession that we um, we continue to um, look at more ways to develop software effectively and, and that we learn how to manage software development more effectively. And are you hopeful for that? Do you, do you have hope? Uh, I, I have to have hope or I would just give up. You know? <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't. You know, what I really care about is making workplaces more humane. Yeah. That's what I really care about. That's what motivates me. And I don't think that that work will be done in my lifetime. But I think I'll do the work while I'm here. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's all we can yeah. do, right? That's all we yeah. can yeah. do. I'll keep doing the work while I'm here. And, you know, it's a, it's a big systemic problem. You know, it's tied up with you know, the history of management. It's tied up with how management is taught in, in MBA schools. It's taught, you know, it's tied up in how, what people see modeled. Mm -hmm. But we can create some different models. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, you know I, I know that there are people who are managing differently because of, of stuff that I've done and that other people who are working on these issues have done. So, you know, We'll see some change. Yeah. We'll see some change. And it, it won't be done in my lifetime. And there are always going to be people who want to exploit. Mm -hmm. you know, I, can't, I can't stop that. I yeah. don't think we can stop that. But yeah, I have some hope. Partly I have hope because I think, um, you know, people, um, you know, when I started work, we, we, we had certain expectations that this is just how you did it. And you dressed a certain way and you stayed in, you know, you worked your way up and, you know, you put up with some kind of grunt work for a while. And I think, I think um, people coming into the workplace now aren't going to put up with that crap. I mean, they want responsibility. They want feedback. They want meaning. Yeah. And, you know, some people talk about, oh, they're so entitled. It's like there's, you know, there's nothing unreasonable in wanting, you know, meaning, responsibility, and feedback. There's nothing unreasonable about that. So I think some companies may have to change if they want to have really, you know, the bright, stellar employees. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that gives me hope. Yeah, I like that. And I, that, that's the one thing I think that, that makes me, it's the one part of the green leaf work that I think maybe we've, we've got past, because I think that, what some people call entitlement, what some people call rebellion, I think is is a, is just a sense of knowing what you're worth, um, and I think that's that's what my children's generation is is growing up with, and I think that's good. That's a good thing. That's what our organisation, yep. our workplace need, yep. uh, and that's why I think his statement there, the vast majority would choose disorder even if it meant oppression. I don't think is necessarily true in now the next twenty years. I hope. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah. Um, so that's that's a nice nice way to uh, to end that. Thank you, Esther. Thank yeah, you for joining yeah, us. And yeah, a personal thank you, thank you really for good. for all that you've done and all that you continue oh. to do and are going to continue to do. Yeah. So, thanks very cheers much, to you. Great to see you. Yeah. Cheers. Brilliant.